So my name's Phil. Um, I work here in uh, finance in London. Um, my background though is in video games. You'll see some of that through the presentation. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to talk about F Sharp. Um, I have a background in C++, Assembler, and C Sharp, so a whole load of different assemblers. Uh, I came and started doing professional F Sharp about eight years ago, and I found it very refreshing. I do a mixture of F Sharp and C Sharp. Um, Hopefully I'm going to show you tonight where you might want to use F-sharp with your C-sharp code. Um, so, before we go any further, how many of you are developers? How many of you are not developers? Just checking you can do hands. That's good. Sorry about this. So hopefully you'll still find it interesting. How many of you are C-sharp developers? You're at the right talk. Well done. Um, and Java. It's almost the same. And um, how many people here have done F-sharp? Cool, just, so we've got a few F sharpers. Um, so, again, you're at the right talk because this is an introduction talk. And uh, last one, how many people have done APL? <laughs> Look it up. Um, lots of Greek symbols. So, um, while I'm talking tonight, there's actually an F sharp London meetup uh, going on at the same time. Um, the functional Londoners have 900 plus members. Uh, we're going, growing about 100 every three or four months. Um, we're the largest .NET based use group in the UK and possibly worldwide, I haven't really checked. Uh, we meet every two weeks and we do topics like machine learning, finance, games, web functional. So there's a really big movement around F Sharp in London. It's actually a new functional, uh, sorry, F Sharp user group uh, started in Cambridge two weeks ago. So uh, worldwide, I think we're, we're running around one new F Sharp group per week. So it's growing. Um, we've got a great organic growth. There's no Microsoft evangelist going around telling you to do it. It's just uh, people like me who like it. So um, this is probably the picture you have. It's lovely blue. Uh, and the story behind F Sharp is that in 2010, they put it in first class into Visual Studio. And it's there. It's there waiting for you. File, new project. But you see this, and you're like, what should I, why should I bother? This is the official logo of F Sharp <laughs> um, from the F Sharp T. And, and the F in F Sharp is for fun. And actually, fun is a keyword in F Sharp. So um, the first project. <laughs> it is, it is, we'll see that. Um, so the first project I worked on was Halo 3 with F Sharp. So um, I worked on the matchmaking. I was working um, in a machine learning and perception lab at Microsoft Research, and um, we did all the matchmaking for Xbox Live games. So I had the uh, wonderful job of getting my name on the Halo 3 box and um, doing, doing all the matchmaking. So you've got a million players being matchmaked. Um, every day and uh, you, you want to meet somebody who won't pawn you and you won't get pawned. Right? That's the main thing. You want a 50-50 chance. And we, we re-ran um, for two weeks over 15 machines all of the outcomes from Halo 2 to, to create models um, using f -sharp. and then we uh, adjusted our parameters and uh, everything worked out really well. People loved playing Halo 3 and they got match mates really well. So that was my first experience with it. Um, I've done uh, lots of finance, uh, other games with it, all sorts of things. Um, so to, to move on, let's, let's, uh, we talked about using it. What is F Sharp? Uh, this is not the official cover um, from O'Reilly, but it probably should be. Um, F Sharp is statically typed. So if you're using C Sharp, that's statically typed, right? So um, you've got types, that's great. When I show you code, you're not going to see a massive generics and types. That's because it's type inferred. It's going to look dynamic. The compiler is doing all the typing and working for you. Right? That's quite a win. Um, it's functional first. So like our 12, um, 12 points, um, it's immutable. Uh, it's safe for concurrency by default. Functional first. But we can do object-oriented. And I'm going to show you object-oriented live in a second. I actually prefer F Sharp for object oriented over C Sharp. It's open source, Apache license, it's a .NET language, runs on Mono, Visual Studio, Xamarin Studio. So you can run F Sharp on Mac, Linux, OpenBSD, GPU, JavaScript, you name it, we run there. And um, with the Mac, um, 
with Xamarin Studio, Mac and Linux, same sort of experience that you get on uh, Windows, and you can target iOS and Android. So you can do full, full mobile apps. Um, so, uh, more silly slides. Um, the way, way you should think about C Sharp and F Sharp or, or VB.net is good friends. We shouldn't be replacing it. We shouldn't, you, want, you don't have to dig up your whole code base and start again. If you think a module is going to work better in F Sharp, for the reasons I'll hopefully show you in a bit, do that. If you don't, don't do that. Don't rewrite everything. Um, you've got perfectly good code and you've spent a lot of time testing. Keep with that. The great thing about F Sharp over something that's say on, on the JVM or, or not on any platform is that with F Sharp you can just call your C Sharp code. Your C Sharp code can call you. There's no messing about. You don't have to throw away all of your legacy. So um, Kaggle is a data science company in San Francisco. Um, they were doing C Sharp. They had a large existing uh, code base in C Sharp. Getting started with F Sharp was an easy decision for them. They got, and, and the, the reason is, um, sorry, this isn't a real cover, there's a theme going on here. Um, the, <laughs> F -sharp, um, the F Sharp code is consistently shorter, easier to read, easier to reflect, and has fewer bugs. They felt more productive. Happy days. Right? So they kept their existing C Sharp code and started using new modules in F Sharp. And we're seeing a lot of people doing this. Actually, uh, if you want a, the current example, it's not actually a C Sharp transition, but there's a um, 600 million um, uh, investment in a company called Jet.com, which are taking on Amazon at the moment. They're completely F Sharp. That's over in New York. So, uh, you all said you're a developer, so you're probably bored of slides now. Let's do some code. Now, this is the hardest part of the presentation for me, is to switch out of PowerPoint, but hopefully we'll do a nice easy transition there. Hopefully. Okay. Can you see that? Do I need to make the font any bigger? Can you see it at the back? Cool. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to write a C-sharp class, which seems a bit weird for an F-sharp presentation. But what I want to do is show you how you can transform your F-sharp code to C from, from your C-sharp code to F-sharp and what benefits you get. So what I'm going to do is going to make a um, class for people. Um, we're going to have a name and an age. And I'm going to make this class immutable. So you cannot change it. I could use auto properties. Um, that wouldn't actually make it fully immutable. We could have a private set. That might save a few lines, but not a huge amount. But what I want to do is generate something where we get the equivalent code in F sharp. So we'll save off our name and age, our constructor. If you're doing um, C sharp, probably, how many people here are doing dependency injection? This is the kind of thing you'll do every time you do, you do a, a class. But because I'm trying to do, a, do samples in half an hour, I don't have really time to, to do the full pattern. Um, so then I'd probably have some sort of property <coughs> How many people here work in the enterprise? No, oh, it's lots of you lucky people. So, uh, if you're in the enterprise, somebody might say to you that you need a full comment there. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know what the name was. <laughs> I kid you not. I've had that before. <laughs> Okay, it's getting quite boring, isn't it? <laughs> right, there's a point to that. It is really boring. This is what we do when we're doing C sharp code. Can anybody tell me how many times I've typed the word name so far? 15. Six, I think. I kind of lost count. I call this the local government pattern because you have to fill everything out in triplicate and then again. Um, so, we'll probably we'll just chuck in an override for two string. And we'll do a string format. Um, sorry, I'm reverting to F sharp code already. 
you would do this, not that. Okay. It was really, really boring, wasn't it? So, what I'm going to do now is show you how that looks in F-Sharp, how we would translate that. I'm going to drop it into a text pad so it just doesn't moan at me all the time. I'll just get a quick character count before we start. So, about 37 lines of code to do a person with two properties and overall. Fantastic. First, well, we'll bring it down to 34 because we didn't need the usings. First thing, curly braces are out. Notice that our code is all indented anyway. So, like Python, F sharp uses the indentation by default to determine the lines. Now, the nice thing about that is that we are now on the page. That's a good start. If you did have to do those horrible enterprise things here, um, by default F sharp works out that if you haven't put it inside an XML tag, it is, in fact, a summary. Right? So it's just shorter. So we're actually it's starting to get a bit nicer. But what about this bit here? It's just we're constantly doing this mess. Now if person was a function in C-sharp, what we would do is we would just say name, string name in age, and we'd be able to use it everywhere else. Right? So it would it'd be like a closure. All of those things are available. That's how F-sharp works. So let's just do that. Ah, goodbye. Um, so that's kind of key. Also, we don't have to capture them because they're available to us. Contentious issue. But things are public by default, makes it a bit easier for testing. You can make them private if you want to, or internal. Okay, so actually we're really getting to the point where we can read it now, and the intent's coming out. To define a member in F-sharp, we use the member keyword. Um, and I'm nearly done. Also, we don't need to give the types, it will work that out for us with magic. <laughs> also known as type inference from the 70s. <laughs> Just never caught on that quickly anyway. It's caught on now, it's all the rage. Scala, Haskell, all of those. Swift. Swift, exactly. Um, so yeah, it is kind of getting there. These ideas from the 70s are finally starting to catch on. So, so does it, sorry, does that mean you're talking about type inference there? Does that mean that you could call the constructor of that class with name and age that weren't string and int, and that would be a valid thing to do? That would be fine. The first time you call it, with whatever you call it, that's what it's going to take. But we're going to have some fun now. So, Well, when I want to run my f -sharp code, I can use a full project, or I can just cut and paste it into a script file. There's no need to create a project. Tabs are a problem, though. So using Notepad was a bit of a fail there for me. OK. We can use string format, but what we like to do is go for old school C, and I can do an sprintf. This will produce exactly the same IL code as the C-sharp. Exactly the same. No performance penalty. Right? You can read it. That's kind of nice. Can anybody guess the type who hasn't done F-sharp before <laughs> of, of name and age? Object? Generic? Something else? Anybody brave enough? String. 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 Int. Isn't that amazing? It's actually inferred from percent %s and percent %d that it uh, has to be a string and an integer. So where in C-sharp we have var and you can have a local variable inference, which is cool, you can have it across your whole program in F-sharp. That's kind of neat. Now, if I want to try this out... Sorry. Can, can you assert the, the, the type? Yeah, if, if I wanted to, I can do what I can do in Swift and Scala, I can just put the type in. Now, this is actually kind of cute, and this is actually, F sharp tends to be has stronger typing than um, C sharp with less typing. 
less human typing. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's actually saying here, I wanted it to have, uh, I was expecting a string, but you've given me an integer. It's actually type checked with string formatting. Right? That's kind of nice. Okay. I can use this class from C Sharp now. Uh, let me just fix it though. So, sorry, just to continue that example. So, you, you indicated before that it uses type inference based on the format string to work out. Yeah. The, okay, which I kind of get that. So, what would happen then if you called the constructor of that class and passed in something that wasn't a string and then would it compile? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what we can do, I don't even have to compile to do that. There is a REPL, so I can just push that into the REPL, and um, sorry, I'll just get that there. so it's actually put that class there, and I can say let is an, there's not many keywords. There's type let and fun. Let is the same as var. Right. <laughs> so I can say that I am a person, and I'm called Phil, and I'm 27. Honestly. <laughs> and um, that's all cool. And if I just say I was 27. Like so, then it's saying I wanted an int, you gave me a string. Right. Done. Cool? Right. So are you saying that that's runtime rather than compile time type check? Yes. Right. So, so it's, it's compile time type, type check. It is the same as C shit. Right? right, so sorry, that failed when it tried to build it rather than when it tried yeah. to build it. Yeah. 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 But you've got all of the speed of a dynamic language and the lack of having to mess around. You just write code. Um, now that was quite short, so we went from about 30 to about three or four lines of code. That's good for domain modeling. We're on a page. Actually, I can do the same thing in one line of code in F sharp. So I can say a person or a peep has a name and an age of an integer that produces the same IL code. Right. <laughs> Please, what about the string? Oh, okay. I, if I want to do the two string, then I go with override two string. So I'm still, maybe I can add half a line extra, but I'm still in. <laughs> it's still very, very beautiful. So um, let's just try this out. So I was, I've been running a script. I'm just going to promote that into a full F sharp library that I can call from C sharp. Right, so I've got F sharp peeps, same code. Um, so I've played around with it, I'm happy with it now. Um, I'll build that up. So that creates a DLL, it creates the same IL code as if I don't in C sharp, it just happens to be like a core of a number of lines of code and I can actually read it on the page. Um, I go in here, I've added a reference already to save time to F sharp peeps. I can go in here and I'll just put in a, just bear with me, I'll do a public static void main. My, my children love public static void moment. It's so <laughs> obvious. Um, so <laughs> there's F sharp peeps. Person. So, var Phil is a new F sharp person. Phil. See the name and age come up? So, it's as if I wrote it in C sharp. I just didn't have to waste my time. And the XML comments have come up. Um, var Thomas is a new. Um, we'll just put in peep, and I just, oh, oh. <laughs> what's the screen say? Um, I can do the refactor stuff, so I resolve the name, so just, you know, everything works as you'd expect, right? So I do a new peep. Now remember, I did that in one line. It's now given me in C sharp the constructor and the age, right? It's just shorter. It's just quicker, you get stuff done. Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna show you some, some other stuff. I'll just complete that. Uh, unit testing. Now, um, one of the good places to start with F-sharp, maybe not go straight into your code base with no idea what you're doing in a brand new language and start writing a new component. Maybe start doing some unit testing. And, <coughs> F sharp makes unit testing C sharp code a lot easier. And I'll show you. This is, um, we open n unit. You could open MS test or X unit. We define a test and we could put white space in our, in our names. 
And I, don't, I haven't got any noise classes here. So here I just write 2 plus 2 should equal 4. Winning. And all of that lovely type inference is there for you as well. Okay. If I was using uh, another package called fsunit, because f-sharp has first-class functions, I can actually write 2 plus 2 should equal 4. It's just nice. You write your tests like they're English. Okay, so all of your mocking, your BDD libraries, your dependency injection stuff, all of your C-sharp stuff that you love, you can use it in F-sharp. There's even better libraries that you can use in F-sharp if you so wish. I'll give you one example, one of my libraries for mocking. I quite like mock you. And uh, I did a, an F-sharp version, which also supports all the F-sharp's features. I went on the internet, on Twitter, and I said, what shall I call my F-sharp mock you library? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, everybody said, fuck you. And, uh, yeah, that's what it's called. So if you want to download <laughs> I'm up to 5,000 downloads on fuck you now. There's a, um, I nearly spat my tea out about two years ago when... Um, there's a, a testing library called Autofixture, which pushes um, your um, like, uh, constant variables into your tests, and, and uh, you put in an argument and you push them in. And there's one for F sharp called Auto Fuck You. Um, <laughs> I was just like, you gotta be joking. Um, I, and I'm just waiting until I get version 2 out because that will be Auto Fuck You too. Um, right. So, <laughs> Um, let's go over to um, some little code samples I prepared for you. So, all of your like normal class and functions and if thens and all of that's there. You've got loads of powerful things like pattern matching and beautiful things. Also, a much more powerful <coughs> type system with type inference. But we've got one feature that's just mind blowing, and this is type providers. Now, type providers, in effect, put the whole world of data at your finger screen, fingertips, inside Visual Studio, or Xamarin, or on Modern <coughs> Linux. It all works the same. So I'm going to literally connect to the world now. I'm going to connect to the world bank. I'm going to connect live, which is kind of scary, because it could go wrong. Um, I open up a type provider called f -sharp Data. It's got a lot of data um, type handling. I'm impatient. Now this will actually go live to the World Bank and pull down the list of interfaces available on that API. Okay? So these are the, the um, possibilities I've got. I've got countries. So here's all the countries that the World Bank knows about. So we can drop in to the United Kingdom and have a look at the indicators available. Now this is everything that the World Bank has on, on Great Britain. Literally it's the world at your fingertips. Dot, 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 that, bang, got it. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, now, <coughs> here I've got, um, I, I've defined GB as Great Britain and France as France, FR for France, and I want to compare CO2 emissions. There we go, bang. <laughs> cool. Um, that's kind of nice. And let's say I've, I want to compare G Britain, France, and Germany on military expenditure. We can see that um, actually Germany's dropped below the 2%. It should be there for NATO. And um, Britain and France have actually, their military spending has dropped off a cliff over the last 20 years. And, but they are still valid members of NATO, all in just a couple of lines of F shell. That's nice. Okay, let's go in a bit. Now, that's World Bank, but you can actually connect to any JSON, any, anything. You, could, you can connect to an XML web service, you can connect, uh, connect to a JSON service. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to um, the Open Weather API, and I'm going to get the weather for Bristol. Okay, there he is. So I will pull down the JavaScript. Now... This could be any JavaScript, and what it'll do is actually infer the types over the JavaScript for you, so you can just dot through it. Okay? Uh, there's no code gen, it just works that stuff out for you. It is magic, sorry about that. We can talk about it down the path if you like. Um, and here's, uh, you've got the XML here to have a look at, but 
Um, yeah, I could find out the number of clouds. I don't know why they would have that. <laughs> but um, if I do main dot temperature, that will give me the temperature. It's already entered in here. So <coughs> if we drop that out, um, that's a rather large number. I guess that's in some scale that I don't know. Um, but that, there you go. It's cool. Million. Yes, I think <laughs> we're off by a number. I think 2.8 more than that. Wonderful JavaScript, I love it. <laughs> so, um, my next thing, we can we've, we can connect to XML and we can connect to JSON. A lot of data, is, like on Wikipedia, is in tables inside HTML. Well, you know, you want to just you maybe you want to get to that. So I want to plot the football league, right? There's a football league table in here. So what I'll do is I'll create a HTML type provider to the URL that we just looked at, and I'll get a sample, and I will type football. And that's actually connected and got that page back, and I can see what tables are available. And there's a league table, winning, right? <laughs> so, happy days. Um, what I'll do now is I can go over that table, and I'll say for a, all the rows, in uh, football tables, league table, I'll go from row one because I don't want the header, right? So I'll just do one dot dot. So that's slicing features in Python and um, F sharp. So there's my football table winning. Um, but you know, you could go and get Doctor Who values or presidents or, or whatever you want, you know? And um, I can then just chart that. Hopefully. Oh, I'm going to do it a different way because it's gratuitous. Um, we'll come back to it. What I've done now is I, I couldn't get the built-in charts working for whatever reason. I probably had to reset the view. Probably got it's just dodgy. It's Microsoft on there. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so what I've done instead. Have you anybody heard of the programming language R? Yeah, the one for, not the one for pirates, the one for data science. <laughs> and um, what I've done, so I can be R provider, and literally I am talking to the R language by pressing R dot. And there's all of the um, packages available on R, and all of the functions, so I can just get R to do the plot for yeah. me, which is nice. Okay, um, let's hop over to... So I've, I've shown you, I don't have a lot of time, I've shown you some, um, shown you kind of standard um, web-based things, but probably what you, you guys do using, I heard SQLite mention, you might want to connect to Oracle or SQL Server, exactly the same mechanism. All we do, we put in the connection string, and I'm going to connect to the Northwind database on SQLite. There's, um, I'll ask for the customers. Now this is something you can't get in Entity Framework and all that other rubbish. Um, <laughs> I want to just find out people. I want, you know, I'm, I'm an intro, I'm, I want to know about people. There you go. I've actually gone in and I've picked up all of the people <laughs> on the database, and I can go and scroll through them and issue a query against them using link. <laughs> So that's kind of nice. So why would I use SQL Enterprise Manager anymore? It sucks. Um, and <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can just issue queries against database. Cool. So um, I'm, I'm going to come out of that. There's a limit to how I'm trying to show you. Hopefully you're excited now, though. Fast, reliable, tiny code produces, connects to anything. You can't get and other languages. So not only can we connect to R, we can connect to Python, we can connect to Java, we can connect to MATLAB. The world's your oyster. We can even connect to JavaScript and call JavaScript. So after all that excitement, it's time that you had to suffer some slides. I'm just going to out and let you do questions on me. Uh, I am available for demos in the pub. That's just one of my things. Sorry about that. Um, so we looked at like syntax, POCOs, 
although it's unfair on C-sharp because we could have done auto properties, you are doing this all the time when you're doing an injection. We had a quick look at unit testing type providers. If you're interested in taking F-sharp further, learning a bit more about it, I hope you are, um, it is really easy um, to get in. The only hard thing about F-sharp is unlearning C-sharp, is, is wanting to press semicolon, right? is wanting to insert curly brace. That's the tricky bit. Go to fsharp.org. All the resources you need are there. It's uh, um, outside of Microsoft. It's the F-sharp Software Foundation. It's the community pr producing this for you. Uh, democratically elected and funded as a charity. And that's what allows F-sharp to run cross-platform. Beyond that, you can... Um, try the F-sharp Cohen's. So the F-sharp Cohen's comes from the Ruby Cohen's. It's a set of failing tests. And each time you make a test pass, you learn a new element of the language. And this is really good if you're coming from C-sharp like I did, because the syntax is one of the hard things. You know, conceptually it's not that hard. It's like, it's another .NET language with really tight syntax and more powerful capabilities. But you're, you're hit by the syntax. So it takes about an hour and a half to go through it, and then you're done. You've got the syntax covered, and you know the language features. Once you've done that, there's a um, lovely website called tryfsharp.org. We are making this hard, aren't we? All these really hard URLs. Um, and tryfsharp.org has got more advanced um, uh, sets of things for you to try. So guided steps. Uh, all the way up um, here, it's doing uh, European pricing options. It will plot graphs in the browser. You've got full IntelliSense in the browser. You can also run uh, machine learning <coughs> algorithms against Hadoop inside with IntelliSense, which is something you can't do any, on any other platform, just inside this browser, which is nice. Some people like um, owning books. And I think that's great, because I've got a book on the market. <laughs> uh, F-sharp deep dives that I did with Thomas Petrachek. If you're coming from, I'm not going to say, if you're, look, you're coming in to learn F-sharp for the first time, actually I, I'm going to recommend uh, Chris Smith's Programming F-sharp, or Thomas and John Skeet's Functional Programming. Um, F-sharp deep dives is a book we worked on. The idea was there's enough Hello World books out there. What we wanted to do was show you a uh, large-scale application of F-sharp in very successful businesses and how that was achieved. So we've got a chapter from uh, an expert in F-sharp. So we've got social gaming, finance, machine learning, all of the kind of interesting things you might want to have a go at. And then they describe how they did their work. Um, on the more uh, exciting side, or academic side, Programming Language Concepts is a book used um, for teaching undergraduates in Scandinavia. Uh, it's actually written in English, thankfully. And um, that, all of the examples are in F-sharp, so that's what they use. And um, that teaches you how to write your own C-sharp compiler, garbage collector, all these kind of nice things. So if you're interested in the computer science side of things, it's only about 300 pages, obviously, because of the terseness of the language. You can also buy T-shirts. This is an official F-sharp org T-shirt. But yeah, you know, full fan club status. Um, beyond buying things, I'll just uh, quickly before I throw it to questions, uh, do a little bit of uh, selling. There's a F sharp conference in London in April, on April 17th. Um, if, I'll hand out some, I'll put some flyers out here so you can get £50 off. Um, that's a one day conference with people like Don, who wrote the language, some of the biggest names in the industry, two tracks. Um, beyond that, I'll be speaking at the SDD conference at the Barbican about F sharp along with a bunch of other people. Um, at NCrafts, we have an old whole F sharp track at the Software Craftsmanship Conference in, uh, in Paris. It should be fun, that's about 200 euros, that one. And um, there's a whole F sharp track at NDC Oslo, which I'll be on as well. So um, we are growing, we're not as big as C sharp. Our code will never be as big as C sharp. <laughs> There you are. Um, thanks. Um, so, any questions? Yeah. Some of the examples you showed, which are, are really impressive, um, how much is 
due to the language, how much is due to the fact that there's zillions of bindings to all sorts of things available? Yeah, so the question is, uh, how much is it due to the language and how much is it due to um, crazy libraries? Um, so F-sharp on, on the type provider side, so the connection to data, the type provider mechanism is unique to F-sharp in commercial languages. There's a few academic languages that are, are, are working on it. Um, that mechanism allows that to happen. Um, actually, I think a lot of what makes F-sharp great is the community. So the community has developed these libraries, which are actually very small and easy to write. But they've done that over three years, so you've got really mature libraries to connect out to these data sources, developed by hedge funds in the US, some of them, you know, you've got serious people involved in this, making high production quality um, systems, and that's part of the magic as well. So I think, for me, when you, when you look at a language, when you, when you move into Python, you're buying into a lazy fair group who like to get stuff done um, and don't care about types, um, you, you get into Ruby, you, you buy into that hipster, get stuff, things stuff done. You buy into an enterprise language, you get what you asked for. And, um, you, know, you buy into f -sharp, you get a cool community who are building really interesting things around data extraction, data science. They're doing a lot of math, they're doing a lot of complex stuff. And if you want to be hanging out with people like that, you might choose f -sharp, you might choose Scala. You probably want to choose one of those heavyweight not heavyweight, but you know, something where people are doing interesting things in your area. Um, so, and, and the community I find to be really good and really expanding. I encourage you to, to uh, get involved with us. Did that? Yeah, no, 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 yeah, no, 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 no question. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what do you still use C Sharp for? Um, I use C Sharp for. Um, Anything that was written before F sharp, <laughs> um, because as I say, I really don't think there's any point in throwing away code that works because you will have spent probably eons putting in all of those hacks that makes the client happy, right? And just to get back to there, it's going to take a long time. So why bother? Unless it's really broken, then throw it out and, and rewrite in F sharp. Um, another area is. If, if I'm doing like a XAML view or a WinForms view, and I want a backing page that, that does calls one function after you press the button, I'm going to do it in C sharp. It doesn't matter what I do, it, and it's going to be boring. Um, so, you know, why 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 take the F sharp at that point? But if I'm doing something computational, I want to access data. That's where I'm going to think about using F sharp. So, are there any applications um, that you think F sharp is is unsuitable? compared to C sharp. Um, no, I mean, F sharp's a general purpose language and it's excellent for solving all problems, but I think, you know, the reality is that we have, we've, we've had like 12 years of C sharp, 20, nearly 20 years of Java, it's nearly 20 years, and there's these huge code bases, and uh, I don't think it's realistic to uh, just drop everything on the floor with those and try and re rewrite them from scratch. There's, there's no new project. That where you would choose C sharp over F sharp because of some limitations. Yeah, I I don't think there's any reason why you wouldn't use F sharp um, apart from politics potentially um, being fearful of new things. Um, but realistically, if, if you know if you're doing something that in effect is a database app, right? So you have a database back end and then. Uh, there's very little logic and you, you show some HTML and JavaScript at the end, you could do it in PHP and it'd be fine. Sure. Um, so, you know, I, and you're not going to win much. Uh, that's, that said, I, I kind of think that, there's that perhaps that's the wrong mentality because that just pushes people into using something for their first go. And then when they want to do something like add a recommendation engine, they're lost because they don't have the tools to do anything better. So we just end up with endless websites that all look the same and the thing that happens every year is another makeover on CSS. Does that sound familiar? Um, so yeah, I think if you know you want to drive into the business intelligence side of things, you'd, you'd want to be choosing something a bit stronger potentially. Yeah. Curious, what's Microsoft's opinion on this? Obviously you're making, obviously it makes C-sharp look pretty, pretty crap. So. 
Well, uh, it's not really my intention. No, to, no, I just mean, what's, what's your evangelist's thoughts on F-Sharp? You know, are they starting to see the light or what? Yeah, I mean, you've got some evangelists talking about it. I think if you are wanting to do uh, complex... Uh, this is the... Um, Microsoft's literal line is F-Sharp is the safe choice for functional first programming on the .NET platform. <laughs> right? So if you are trying to do something that requires, that needs to be safe, it needs to deal with concurrency without having to have separate processes, um, then you should be looking at F-sharp. If you aren't, then do whatever. Um, and I think a hybrid, uh, I don't hate C-sharp, I think it's a, it's a great language, you can do a lot of nice things, Link's pretty awesome, um, it's a little bit noisy, on the boilerplate, um, but you know you can do some nice things with it. And uh, if you don't have a big problem, don't make a big problem. Like that. There's no major politics going play, though, isn't there? Yeah, I, I, for us, um, try and put it another way. For us, we're very happy. We've got some really great, some really really interesting projects. Really successful startups using it. We've got huge investment banks using it. We're large enough to be self-sustaining. We don't necessarily, you know, you choose. We're, we're easy. <laughs> um, yeah. So a sharp's uh, immutable by default. Does yeah. that make the sort of architectures you have to use it with change as opposed to something like C sharp? Yeah. Um, so yeah, F sharp's immutable by default. You can, unlike something like Haskell, where it it's pure. F sharp's. Um, like Haskell, you've taken it down the pub for a few drinks. Um, so if you want to be mutable, you just add the mutable keyword. Whereas in C Sharp, you're just mutable. Right? So um, you, you can do those nice things. I mean, for me, I, I work in games or finance. That's what we sort of hit switch between. They're both games, really. Um, both <laughs> involve the same sort of math and the same sort of architectures. Um, but um, arrays are incredibly fast, you know. Dictionaries are incredibly fast, <coughs> and you know sometimes I want to go really fast in those tight loops, and I can, and I can call C sharp code or C code. Um, but what I can do for the 99% of my code that isn't speed op speed optimized, that doesn't need to be speed optimized, I can have safe code, and I'm happier with that. that that's probably a more sensible default than having unsafe for 99%, not 100% of your code. For, from personal experience, um, writing some large apps, I can completely avoid using lock. Right? So all of all of the deadlock issues and low-level threading primitive issues that you get um, with low-level programming, you can avoid. Except for maybe a tight bit that you want to run. So, and you can encapsulate. How do you handle the fact that um, a reasonable majority of programmers don't get recursion very well, or find it <laughs> difficult to work in recursion? Yeah, so the question is, uh, people find recursion hard. Um, yeah, so in Erlang, um, you, there's no for loop, and you have to do recursion, or you have to define a rec find, a, find how to do it online. f shops supports for loops. Um, it has all of the link star operators plus plus. It has like loads more. So 99.9% .9 of the time, you can just use a built-in combinator and you could get by without ever having to deal with recursion. If you love recursion, it is there waiting for you in both arms. So, um, but it's, it's not required like in Erlang or Haskell. Um, you could easily get away with it for years without having to use it. So, like for that, so. I'll, I'll take one up there and then come back to you. Um, Always sounds like one of the core features of F sharp the units of measure, but you haven't heard, you haven't mentioned it. Oh, half an hour is a real struggle, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. oh, do you think they're not such a big deal, or are they very useful? Um, for I have used them um, when I was working on True Skill, which is what all of the Xbox 360 games use for matchmaking. Um, we did it before units of measure, and then we put the units in, and we found a bloody error. It is awesome. It is amazing. Um, if you're doing maths. Right? And to be honest, you know, most of developer stuff is enterprise. If you are doing maths, it's just the docs. It's great. And even then, 
um, you can, even without heavy mass, you can put those type annotations in so you can have your check code. You can have pixels and you can have world coordinates. We can have degrees and radians with units and measure types. And if you try and mix them, it will give you a compile error. And so, so basically, in, in C sharp or Excel, you just have numbers. You don't have any unit concept. And that's where loads of maths goes wrong, right? F sharp has that built in, and it will, it will work out that if you multiply one measure by another, it's a square. And if you divide by another, it'll be meters per second squared, all that kind of thing. That's just there. And when you compile it, it does all of the compile time checking. It removes it for runtime because it knows your code's safe. So you get all of that beauty of, compile, of safety without any runtime performance penalty because it's not required at runtime. Compiler's done its job. So that's very cool. But yeah, it, it doesn't come up that often because most people are just pushing bytes around. I, I've got quite a lot of C code where every variable is prefixed by its unit and I have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it with classes, but you're not going to get this property of um, it, in, it turning up in a type inference and it being boiled away and costing you nothing. So, you know, you're, you're going to end up with faster code. You like faster code. Um, so, to you. Is there any concurrency support? Yes. Um, so, immutability by default is fantastic for concurrency because it means that you can't, you don't have global mutable state by default. That's usually where C sharp programs, Java programs go wrong. On top of that, it has an agent based system built in like Erlang's. And it looks almost like Erlang's, and that lets you do message passing. So in effect, like you were, you, we were talking about processes earlier, and you have the encapsulation of processes for safety, that's all built in to F Sharp for you, which is just fantastic. So I've used that a lot, and that's how I've been able to avoid locking. And you can build fault-tolerant, high-performance systems without having to use a process for each one. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, actually, on the Erlang F Sharp side, we find that the Erlang, if you've got Erlang, you've got F sharp, you've got F sharp, you've got Erlang, the syntax is quite similar, um, and the agents are very similar. And so you find that people in Erlang will use F sharp for compute, and people in F sharp will use Erlang for distribute, right? Because they're different problems. F sharp's awesome for compute. It's also good for distribution, but not as good as Erlang. Erlang's got 12 years of library for that. Um, was there another question? I, I'm standing between you and the pub, I am. <laughs> you are giving me questions. But, uh, Go on, then, last one. Yep. In your experience, how hard is it to bug fix F sharp code? Yeah, how, how, how easy is it to bug fix F sharp code? It's really easy. You've got all of, it, all of the debugging that you have in C sharp, you've got the full debugger support. So you just set a breakpoint, all good. You can also just Unlike C Sharp, you can just pull out a fragment of code and you can execute an interactive window and try it out. Which you, you, know, you don't have to launch out the whole app. You can just go, I'll just have a play with this function and see if it makes sense. So that's more powerful. We only touched on it briefly, but the type system in F Sharp is way, way more powerful. For example, what are your most common flaws in your C Sharp programs? No reference exception, anyone? Right. Pro uh, look at your code base, probably 40 or 50% of your error is a null reference exception. So F sharp doesn't have null reference. That's most of your errors come in one hit. Unfortunately, you can call F sharp from C sharp with a null reference. <laughs> <laughs> but we just, we, we just protect our barriers with borders with C sharp against it. Um, but that, yeah, that's huge. So, yeah, from a. Um, when I run my F sharp code, I am really confident if it compiles, it will work. When I run my C-sharp code, I'm probably like the rest of you, I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> I'm not sure if I got that one. Did I do that line right? Because the compiler hasn't got my back, and I can probably, I'm probably going to null ref on the first go. So, that's a good last question, though, because we didn't do nulls. Just that feature alone, forget everything else, just the losing the billion dollars mistake of nulls is enough to switch. Thanks very much. Cheers.